is actually broken down into 12 different separate galleries that highlight different periods in time. Now, our second gallery uh, is really our Native American exhibit, where we discuss the peoples who lived here in Adams County uh, prior to European settlers. And it's kind of difficult to uh, discuss uh, the time frame because it is a large time frame. And um, I noticed Phil uh, talked about the period of the dinosaurs uh, to the present day, and you got a, an idea, whoop, wrong way, you got an idea of um, how long ago that was. But uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, Native Americans have been in Pennsylvania uh, for some 12,000 or more years. And if you take that time and the time that we have been here, uh, Native Americans account for 98% of Pennsylvania's human history. So we would only be here for about 2% European uh, settlers of that period. And, you know, um, the National Park Service breaks down uh, the time that Native Americans lived in this area into... Um, uh, you know, periods. We got the Paleo, Paleo Indian period, the Archaic period, and the Woodland period. And of course, the time that we're here and European settlers and interact with Native Americans is generally referred to as the contact period or the colonial period. Now, uh, sometimes they break down the Woodland period into the transitional period and the middle Woodland period and um, the late wood woodland period. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we know about the Native Americans that lived in this area, there are two fine books on the subject, and we decided to carry both of them in our gift shop for people who want to learn more. And one of them has been out for years and years and years, and it's actually been revised several times by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, and that's um, Indians in Pennsylvania which is a really fine book, and um, I'm a big fan of it. A more modern book that incorporates archaeology and the things that have been discovered uh, in Pennsylvania by the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission is First Pennsylvanians, and it is an excellent book with lots of uh, information in it. One of the challenges for us is that we don't have any written history for most of the period that peoples lived in this area. So what we know about them is based on the artifacts that are found where they once lived or archaeological digs that have been done at places where there were large encampments or villages. Uh, but just to give you an idea, the Paleo Indian period is about 14,500 to 18,000 uh, BCE, which stands for, in case you're not familiar with it, before the Common Era. Um, and, you know, the first inhabitants of Pennsylvania came here during the last ice age when temperatures were pretty, you know, frigid. And uh, these people traveled in groups, and for the most part, moved around and followed game animals. Uh, the Archaic period, which is about 8,000 years ago to 2,300 years ago, uh, is where the Ice Age um, glacier started to retreat to the north, and uh, there was a greater diversity of plants and animals, of course, because it was warmer, and, uh, you know, people started, st stopped following uh, the migrating tribes of animals and formed more permanent uh, communities. And from our area, we definitely see uh, the stone objects we're finding are from that period, or at least from starting from that period. And, you know, it is fascinating to me that this is something that anyone can do. If you own a large field, you can spend some time and walk through that field better after someone has plowed the field and before their crops growing in it. If you get and get, of course, you got to get permission from the farmer. It's good to do after a rain and you can walk along and, you know, 
you will eventually find a spear point or an arrowhead. I, myself, have found spear points and arrowheads in the fields around Adams County. Now, granted, when I was a kid, I had a metal detector. And while I was metal detecting and you're looking at the ground, invariably, you would see arrowheads on that same ground. Um, the transitional period, which again is part of the woodland period, uh, the, cr the climates really grew warmer. And since there are large um, groups of people living together or villages, you see all kinds of, um, uh, you know, the emergence of um, uh, some kind of pottery. But again, anything wooden that, uh, you know, these people use since it's been so long ago really doesn't survive. Um, uh, and then we have, you know, what we call the woodland period which is just up until the period before European settlement. But I think it's important to note that when someone finds an arrowhead in a field today, many people just imagine that these artifacts are hundreds of years old. And in reality, they're thousands of re years old. The contact period, of course, is when uh, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, was first settled and Europeans or, um, uh, you know, meeting the Native American tribes in this area for the first time. And of course, there begins to be trade with Europeans and uh, we find things in the ground or in the fields that actually are um, either traded to them by European settlers or, um, you know, uh, manufactured because of their knowledge now of uh, European settlers. Um, as far as our area goes, um, we don't really seem to have any villages or any Native Americans living in our immediate area at the time of the first European settling in this area in the 1730s and 40s. By that time, Native Americans had um, migrated out to Western Pennsylvania. And during the period of the French and Indian War in the 1750s, uh, we're actually talking about French and Native American, Shawnee, and Delaware uh, Indians actually raiding into this area from out in western Pennsylvania. So there's no time where in Adams County, uh, European settlers are living beside uh, a Native American village. But the first interaction in this area uh, with European settlers and Native Americans is Captain John Smith. You probably know that he was in Jamestown and, you know, and, and as part of that early settlement, he took several voyages up into the Chesapeake Bay. And on one of those voyages, he went up the Susquehanna River. And on a map that was printed not long after his voyage, I think maybe this part of the map here is from like um, uh, 1612, uh, you can see at the bottom, he actually has a drawing and it says, the Susquehannocks uh, are a giant like people. And I can't even read that. I forgot exactly what he says. Um, so he, this is an uh, illustration that appeared on this early European map that was made of the Susquehannocks. And the archeological digs that have been done along the Susquehanna River feature the Susquehannock Indians and um, uh, their areas where they uh, inhabit and areas that they lived in. And so our knowledge of early, earlier Native Americans lived in this area undoubtedly uh, is influenced by our knowledge of what these people were like when they were first encountered by European settlers. But this, um, this portrayal of the Native American there, you see, is the one that generally is given for the Susquehannocks in our area. And of course, you know, being giant like people might mean like that they're six feet tall because European settlers, because of all the disease and maybe the, um, you know, the living in close proximity to each other, they're probably like tall to them is like five feet six or five feet seven. And I should mention a height is one of those things that has varied over the years from place to place around the world. It's not something that we're not constantly getting larger. <laughs> um, but here's a um, 
from the early 1600s. Here is a illustration that was uh, uh, printed in a in a, a early European book about what the uh, Susquehannock's uh, fort must have looked like, or the, one of their villages. Now, in our area, settlers are coming in in the 1730s and 40s, and uh, you know, uh, like I said, at that time there are no, they're not encountering Native American villages in our area, but um, they are finding things in their fields, just like we find things in our fields today. And, you know, obviously, uh, before people are picking up these things, there's a lot more stuff laying in the fields. And they're trying to clear areas, and uh, they're plowing the ground for the first time. And uh, Emanuel Bushman is a descendant of one of the early settlers. Uh, he lived in the town of Gettysburg during the battle. Um, his father grew up on a farm south of Gettysburg, where the Battle of Gettysburg was fought all around his property. And early on, after the battle, when people are going out and picking up bullets on the battlefield and picking up you know, things that were left there, pieces of artillery shell, they're also finding um, uh, artifacts from uh, you know, Native Americans. Uh, Emmanuel Bushman was somewhat of a storyteller. He loved to write into the local paper and tell stories of what was, you know, he knew about the area. And so we have him, uh, from him, a, a description of an area that is south of Gettysburg that he calls Indian Field. And he calls it that because of all the artifacts that have been found in the area. And here's actually an article from 1869. It appeared in the Gettysburg newspaper. It was reprinted from the York Press. But it talks about how, you know, the, an archaeological investigation of the country around Gettysburg is yielding large amounts of these early artifacts. Now, Emanuel Bushman tells everybody that there was a bloody battle that was fought near Gettysburg. And he calls it like... Um, you know, the Battle of the Crows. I don't know how he comes up with that name. But basically what was happening is there was a large area that it had trees had cleared away. They were plowing it. And he noticed on one side of the field there was a certain type of artifact or spear point or arrowhead. And on the other side of the field, he was finding a totally different type of predominantly arrowhead or spear point. So he came to the conclusion that these two groups of people were throwing their spears at each other or they're shooting their arrows at each other and there must have been a big battle at this site. Today, archaeologists would determine that these people lived at a different time period than those people over there and that's why the artifacts are different. We would have a totally different conclusion uh, reached. And he had all kinds of stories that he told about it. And, um, of course, he's also one of the people that tells stories about Devil's Den and, you know, tells why it's called Devil's Den. So he's a great storyteller. But uh, uh, there's really no evidence of a large battle. And what I've come to realize is when you talk about Indian Field and you talk about where Indian Field is, um, in his description of it, Indian Field was south of the Eisenhower farm along the Emmitsburg Road, probably in the fields between uh, um, Willoughby's Run and like, for instance, uh, the bowling alley at the corner of Emmitsburg Road and Ridge Road. And so out in those open fields on the other side of the road from the bowling alley is where he's talking about. But other people have placed it at other places. And what I've realized, I guess, is that Indian Field basically is any place where they're finding artifacts, you know, arrowheads is Indian Field. Um, there was a booklet printed in 1869. And in the booklet, they talk about all the stuff that's been, been found around the battlefield of Gettysburg. And they call this area the first battle of Gettysburg you know, because we had the battle, but there was a bloodier battle in ancient times where these two groups of people met. And that's how they count for all the artifacts they're finding. Not for the fact that people lived in this area for thousands of years and they're dropping stuff and they have campsites around. But it's interesting that in this booklet, they talk to a Mexican traveler 
who states that the weapons are the same as they, the Aztecs used. And so, you know, this book comes to the conclusion of a northern, a northern Aztec empire. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, the other thing about the booklet is every time they find a piece of artifact, this is not an axe used to chop down trees for firewood or to make houses out of. This is for clunking people over the head. And so everything they find is a battle axe or a spear point or a stone missile or a war club. And I think that when the early settlers were finding items on the battlefield, what is their knowledge of Native Americans? Their knowledge comes from their grandparents who were the first settlers of this area, and during the French and Indian War, raiding parties came into the area and murdered families. Or Emmanuel Bushman is writing this stuff in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. And at, in 1876, is Custer's last stand, what do they know about Native Americans? What is taking place as the United States advances westward in the conflicts between Native American tribes and early Western settlers? So that's the impression they have of Native Americans. So all the artifacts that we have up here to show um, are going to be, you know, from these early, um, uh, you know, Indian, or these, or they're going to imagine they're from these, uh, early battles. So just a couple articles. Here's one that I like. Found Tomahawk from the Gettysburg Star and Sentinel, 1906. And this actually talks about John Thorne, who is Elizabeth Thorne's son. Elizabeth Thorne being the caretaker of the Evergreen Cemetery. And he's actually discovers a tomahawk. And again, what's a tomahawk? It's a stone axe, probably for cutting down a tree. But there's a, everybody's got to carry a tomahawk. You know, you use a knife for a lot of things. You can hit somebody over the head with a stone axe, but more likely you're cutting down a tree. Um, but uh, it's fascinating. Uh, here's a, the sleigh ball farm near Aspers, and here's a 1949 article where uh, the owner of Raymond Sleigh Ball has found so many things in his field that he thinks they must be in the middle of an Indian village or a field as part of an Indian battle. And he talks about where he's collected 200 arrowheads from his field and six different kinds of stone. Um, he found, and he has an Indian tomahawk. And there are lots of articles in our local people, our local paper, sorry, where people are finding artifacts. And it's interesting, I'm glad Jackie's here, sitting in the back. Um, found Indian artifacts. This is from 1914. Mrs. Weikert, while discovers a catch of spear points under a sassafras tree, while digging around the roots of a sassafras tree at her home along the Tony Town Road near Sedgwick. That's the name of a little town near uh, Big Round Top. Mrs. David Weikert, David Weikert, also known as Blind Davy, um, discovered 68 spear points in a very small space. So what's really fascinating for me about this, I lived in this house. I lived in Mrs. Weikert's house, in Blind Davy's house, and I was always digging in the yard to try to find some more arrowheads and spear points. And Jackie owns the property. I rented from Jackie at that time. So here's, you know, here's just, you know, near the Tony, on the Tony Town Road. So, um, and it's fascinating, again, to me, that um, for the kids, you should try to go out in the fields around your house and look and see if you can find artifacts yourselves. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, more recent history, uh, some men from Littlestown on um, Wolf's Hill found an Indian shelter. And they decided to dig at the Indian shelter, like a little, their own little archaeological dig. Uh, you know, um, uh, it says under the supervision of the state archaeologists. And they found a large amount of artifacts uh, up on this, uh, in between the rocks of Wolf's Hill. And again, this is not far from 
Rock Creek, near Culp's Hill. And um, a lot of these artifacts that we're talking about are found in fields along the creek systems. So if you'd like to look yourself for stuff, um, uh, you know, look along Marsh Creek, Rock Creek in open fields that have been plowed, like uh, I, maybe right there would be a good spot, Cliff. Right there. But um, uh, Kano, I lived along Conowaga Creek. I found artifacts along Conowaga Creek, Bermudian Creek. And it's a common thread that the best place to find stuff is in a, in a field along a creek. And uh, at the end here, if you want to come up, I have a, a basket of stuff that was found along Rock Creek, arrowheads and spear points. I have a, a basket of stuff that was found along Middle Creek. And I have a basket of stuff that was found along Conowaga Creek and um, some other various uh, stuff that has been found in the area. And I noticed that one thing about finding this stuff is oftentimes the best um, uh, spare points or arrowheads are made out of the same kinds of rock because, you know, they got to ship the rock and some of it is sharp and it holds it better. Quartz is a really popular type of material. Uh, to use as a spear point or arrowhead. And of course, if you're walking down the field, especially after it rains, the quartz is going to stand out. Um, and uh, rhyolite is, there's a, there was a quarry on South Mountain, several quarries, where Native Americans would go up there and get the rhyolite out and then apparently bring it to spots and there would be like camps where they would work on it and chip it away and um, hone it down so it would be a nice sharp piece. And then it, it appears as if um, the rhyolite from Adams County has been uh, traded or was traded to other Native American tribe and is, tribes and is found in many places um, around the East Coast. So we know that the South Mountain was a place that was perfect for material you'll use to make these um, stone artifacts. I was going to point out that one interesting thing about our county is the watershed or the, um, uh, the stream systems in our county. Have you noticed they're sort of dividing a line that goes diagonally through the middle of our county? And the creeks, Bermudian Creek, Conewaga Creek, to the uh, north and to the east of the county flow into the Susquehanna River, eventually. And you know, the creeks on the south and western part of our county all flow into the Monocacy River and into the Potomac River. And so I'd imagine, and maybe you can try this, there's a spot in our county we can drop a glass of water and some of it will go into the Potomac and some of it will go into the Susquehanna. That flips me out. So along Middle Creek, the amount of artifacts, thousands and thousands and thousands of stone artifacts have come from the fields around Middle Creek. There was a guy named John Eicher who lived along Pumpin' Station Road. And he actually, I think starting in the 1930s, had his own little artifact museum. And uh, there was a guy um, uh, who found a huge amount of artifacts on the o o Weikert property uh, down near Middle Creek, one of the Weikerts, a lot of Weikerts. And uh, he actually wrote an article, and this is a photograph from his article of the different items that he found at this one site. He called it the Weikert site. And you know, it's really difficult for us today to imagine how these early people lived. And again, it covered such a large period of time, thousands of years. Obviously, they lived differently uh, each generation. But um, this book on Pennsylvania, uh, First Pennsylvanians, really gives a, some insight into what we're finding and how we believe those things were probably used. But um, in our museum, what we decided to do was not to categorize the items by the place we were finding them, but by the type of item and the usage that item might have. Uh, broad spears are large, uh, you know, spear points 
that were obviously attached to some kind of um, pole or stick and, you know, used to uh, maybe for in fishing in streams or to throw to uh, wound animals, obviously, you know, you have to eat. Um, projectile points that you can see were um, attached, uh, you know, to uh, some kind of um, uh, spear points were attached to sticks. And again, for hunting and fishing, we have arrowheads. So spear points are a little bit different than arrowheads. Arrowheads are basically the triangle, and they were attached to sticks that were used uh, like with a bow and arrow. And so that was a more recent invention, the bow and arrow, it, we believe, that um, early on we'd be throwing spears. Um, banner stones, you find. And these are stones that are carved and have an actual hole that was kind of manufactured, drilled through them, and they were attached to um, a stick with weight on it that would allow you, um, with this thing called an atlatl, to throw the spear with uh, greater distance and greater force. And if you are interested in this, the atlatl, and you see, you can see how it's spelled there. Let's see, where is it? Oh, they don't say it there, do they? Okay, okay, there it is. You can look it up on the internet, and on YouTube you'll see a video of someone using an atlatl uh, and seeing how, you know, and, you know, I should also mention, if you go to the Pennsylvania State Museum, which is in Harrisburg, just as you cross over the, I guess it's the Harvey Taylor Bridge, and it is on your right there. It's a big, big round building. They have an excellent display that talks about the usages of all these early artifacts that have been found in Pennsylvania. But we have banner stones in our museum that were found in Adams County. Um, early stone axes, like the one um, I showed you here. And obviously, uh, we attached that years ago to um, a, a piece of wood. A stick and we have a large collection can you imagine finding a stone axe in your field um, I have one that I have found and it's just amazing um, drills of course like we said you have to um, put holes and let's say you you wear a, a buckskin and you um, like you know you a deer you have to scrape the the hide clean of the the deer fur and the deer skin and um, you know, you have to sew it so, you know, you can put uh, holes in um, the item with a, with a um, drill. Uh, scrapers, like if you're scraping out some kind of, um, uh, you know, it, uh, deer hide or something for clothing. And also for in the preparation of food. And like I said, we got some large uh, scrapers here. Like this is just incredible. And, you know, it doesn't take... When you're out there and you find a rock, I notice a lot of people, is this an artifact or is this just a rock? And is this chip on it made by human hands or is it made by a plow that hit the rock? I know that's very difficult, but the ones I picked here, it's easy to tell. Sometimes it's not so easy to tell. Um, grinding stones and slabs they use to, to um, you know, pulverize uh, wheat when they're in the production of food, or corn, when corn becomes popular, to make cornmeal. And um, we have a lot of those uh, found in our area. Also, there's an early, uh, um, uh, steatite is like a, um, an early a stone that was a poor stone that was used to make uh, early bowls. And, um, uh, you know, we have some of those in our collection that were found, I think um, mostly at that Weikert site I was talking about along Middle Creek. And then uh, later on, or, you know, not too far long ago, we have pottery. We have pottery pieces that were made by Native Americans, either made here or traded by a group that might have been better at making them from another area into this. And this piece is fascinating that we have that even has designs on it. And these are found at some of these uh, Native American sites, so we know they're not European. They're, you know, they're alongside of um, 
the stuff that was uh, produced by these early groups of people. Uh, there's a thing called a gorget, and uh, they look pretty much, and look, here's this, this uh, illustration we're using up here. This is from um, the Pennsylvania, First Pennsylvanians book, and, you know, they look pretty much like the ones we're finding here that we have on display, and they have holes in them. We're not exactly sure what they are. Maybe they're jewelry. Maybe they are used for some kind of ceremonial purpose that we don't know about because we don't have a written record. Question? Yeah, maybe they use them, they put some things around them, and maybe they hold a pouch shut, or maybe they're used to hold the clothing together. Um, now these, now of course, these, the smaller ones, um, could be for clothing. These are just really big. But yes, um, uh, people speculated about why they're so prevalent at these sites and what they may be used for. So, you know, I mean, we can... Uh, since we don't have a written record of the people, we have to use our imagination a little bit. One of the neat things we have on display in the museum is our Native American quern. A quern is a large rock with a uh, depression in it that was used for the, in the preparation of stuff for cooking. You know, you uh, take a big stone and you can uh, break up your corn or, uh, you know, break up uh, your... Uh, you know, make wheat out of it in a preparation for food for cooking. And our quern was found in Berwick Township, kind of on the backside of the Bridges Golf Course, if you know where that is, um, uh, between Cross Keys and Abbottstown. And it was actually found on a farm, which is off of Racetrack Road, if you know where the, um, the racetrack is there on the backside of the Bridges Golf Course. And again, um, if you want to learn more about some of the stuff that uh, we're discussing or talking about and, and what the latest information is on it, uh, we do sell this really good book on the bookstore uh, on the subject and a, a traditional book that we have that people really like that tries to give you some insight into the customs of the Delaware Indians and Susquehannocks and what we know about their culture uh, is Indians in Pennsylvania. And he did a lot of research into the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Iroquois, uh, and the Susquehannocks in our area. Now, I, uh, if anybody would like to come up for a few minutes and see some of the stuff we have, you may. Um, and then, uh, like we say, that uh, there are some other activities downstairs in our seminar room where Jackie White has some stuff set up where you can actually... Uh, dress up like a colonial, uh, you know, settler. Any questions here before I stop? Question? Well, I think one of the problems that we have with oral history is that the people who lived here, the Susquehannocks, apparently in the, 17, the 1630s, there was, uh, the Susquehannocks were uh, pushed out of this area in some kind of war with the Delaware and um, Indians. And so those people were forced out. Other tribes like the Shawnee and Delaware came into the area and they were part of the Iroquois nation, but the Susquehannocks apparently were not. But then we have uh, some transient people here for a while, but most of them went to Western Pennsylvania. I guess that what I'm saying is we don't have like descendants of the people who lived in our area that we could talk to. It's not like they, you know, there was any uh, communication between these people and the early settlers. Uh, there's very little in the, in the way of, um, well, the oral history we do have is from like Emmanuel Bushman talking about when he was a little boy and his theories on like, if you read my Devil's Den book, I have a whole chapter about his theories about Devil's Den. So, yeah, we don't have much in the way of oral history. And then, and then even if we do, it would be the oral history of the contact period, not the woodland period or the archaic period or the paleo period.
Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, what's really fascinating about that is you probably know that most of the, well, most all the people in here, uh, their ancestors many thousands years ago would have came over from Asia and over and then down, you know, through the Bering Straits or they hopped along the coast and then settled the east. And then, you know, when European settlers come in, they're pushed back out to the west. So um, that is fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody would like to, you're welcome to come up and uh, um, talk to me. And uh, you can uh, see some of the different types of artifacts that we have that were found in our area. That, and you can touch them and play with them. So if any of the kids want to do that, come on up. Well, thank you.